Hello, everybody. I am joined by a very recognizable face. For those who are listening to the podcast, we already talked for like 20 minutes about how much we all love Maria. But for those who are joining us on video, this is Maria Ho, probably the most well-known female face in poker, who is just an incredible person, an incredible ambassador, a, a credible poker player, a, I think it was 2019 broadcaster of the year, a commentator, a basically just like the all around poker boss bitch, Maria Ho. Welcome back to the Poker News Podcast. Hi, thank you for that super nice introduction. I don't know if I'm deserving of all of that, but I'm happy to be here. So thanks for having me on. You 100% are. And it just kind of turned out to be the perfect guest for today's episode because you and my girl, who everyone also on the podcast knows, Tiffany Michelle, I love, were a team on the show, The Amazing Race. And the next season of The Amazing Race just happens to be launching, if not today, then this week, I think at some point, but I want to say it's today. And so I wanted to just get you on the show. I feel like you know, 2022 is here. We need to talk all things. What can we expect? What are we doing in the poker industry? But let's just kick off and start a little bit with the amazing race. Are you still, I saw a picture on your socials of some homies that you're still close with. Are you still connected to the amazing race family, if you will? Oh, for sure. I mean, we definitely bonded for life from that experience. Um, it's funny because obviously in the beginning, you just look at them as your competitors, but then when it's all said and done, you realize that you guys all went through something together that only you guys will understand. Even when I talk about it, even when I am just like anecdotally speaking about it with friends, it's like, they don't fully understand like the the mindset that you have to be in during that, um, the incredible amount of anxiety all of us went through, um, during that experience. And it was life-changing for sure and it was incredible and so much so that us and three other teams all got the same tattoo to commemorate the experience I feel like I might have said this at some point but for those of you who don't know out there we do we have a shared tattoo and the tattoo is the place that we first went to on the first stop of the race for our season it was a place in Japan called Shinagawa um so I'm a Chinese person with Japanese uh, letters on, on their body. I'm, my mom didn't like love that. She was like, I'm confused. Did they like, did the tattoo artist get this wrong? Like, what is this? Why? Why? Um, but yes. So we are very, very close still. Wow. The secret tattoos of Tiffany and Maria that I didn't even realize. <laughs> and, you know, you're, I would argue probably one of the busiest people in poker because you wear so many hats, because you have so many projects and so many things going on. Do you still find the time to watch The Amazing Race? Okay, I'm a huge reality show junkie. Um, so I I will make time. Forget about like having the time. I'm gonna make the time. Um, I have to say for a while after The Amazing Race ended, I didn't watch any other seasons after ours just because you know, it, it's like once you live that experience, you kind of feel like it's not the same to, to watch it and to be able to just be that viewer again. And, and I was still a fan of the show, of course, but it was just different. Um, but then I started watching it again in the last couple seasons. And I've, you know, been a huge fan of Survivor all of these years. So Survivor's on my list. Um, MTV's The Challenge is on my list. I, I'm a little ashamed to say it, but you know, the Bachelor franchise is on my list of, of the reality TV shows that I uh, heavily, heavily indulge in. That's my girl. I've got this problem too. And I've got like no time, but like if I've got time, dude, I'm watching Real Housewives. There's going to be a Real Housewives <laughs> episode going down. And I am also deeply ashamed to admit this. And, you know, it's funny because for those of us in the poker industry, you know, we all know you as a professional poker player. Um, I actually didn't even know you were on the amazing race for many years until, you know, I Googled you and saw, you know, that was a big part of who you were when you're out in the world and in public. Uh, do you think people know you more as like former reality star Maria Ho or professional poker player Maria Ho? Do you get both still? Yeah. And I think it's dependent on the environment that I'm in. Like if I'm in a casino environment, especially in Vegas, it's like, everybody's like, Oh yeah, you play poker. 
the funny thing is, is for a whole year or two after the race, immediately following, anytime Tiffany and I were together, we would get recognized so much, but we would get recognized less so when we were just by ourselves. Cause I think people were so used to seeing us together. So, you know, sometimes you'll see somebody you'd be like, oh, they look familiar. But if you, if you see two people together, then you're, you're like, oh no, that's definitely who I think it is type deal. So, so definitely the first couple of years after when we were together, we would always get recognized. Now I still, from time to time, will get recognized for the race, but consistently in any type of like card room, casino, you know, sports book type environment, everybody's like, oh yeah, you play poker. Yeah. I mean, you're a face, you've been the face of the wind star. I think you're kind of unilaterally accepted as the like main, um, especially female poker commentator, poker face. We all know you mostly for poker. And it's funny because you, Tiffany Michelle, who also has been, um, you know, on poker news, she also has, you know, done several things, was last woman standing a hundred years ago at the WSOP. You also have been the last woman standing. But you guys did that show together. So obviously you had a close relationship before you went on the amazing race. And actually you guys are still, best friends, I think, from what I can tell, which is really an amazing accomplishment. I would argue an amazing journey for a friendship to take and sort of going through these very obscure industries and experiences that most people would not really be able to relate to. But am I right in thinking that you guys are still so close even this many years later? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's funny because we definitely got almost closer when, you know, Tiffany ended up stepping away from the poker industry. And at some point you kind of think, oh, well, if I met somebody through poker, then maybe if they stop playing, we won't be as close, right? Because naturally you won't see them on the tour or, you know, you're just not going to cross paths as often. Uh, but honestly, I think Tiffany and I have gotten closer since we did the race. And, you know, since she's, she's not so much um, in the poker space, anymore and I feel like it's it's one of those friendships that I can honestly say is going to last a lifetime and the truth is is there's not a lot of friendships that I've made through poker specifically that I think I could say that about well I wanted to ask you about something else which is kind of um I don't know random but since we're talking about like deep relationships um and also being one of the most dominant figures I think in the poker space Years ago, when I interviewed you, you spoke about your mom and sort of coming from this like tiger family. And I know that you, I, is your sister's name Judy? Mm -hmm. You have a sister who's, a, she's a very accomplished um, like psychologist or so, she's yep. a very accomplished woman. And just basically that you um, have always had a lot of pressure um, on yourself, you and your sister both to ha have lots of accomplishments and accolades and do well in school and sports and all the things. And, you know, poker is, uh, not popular for a lot of, I think, people um, mm -hmm. looking to have their kids become successful. And yet you have risen to this really incredible position in the poker space. And I wanted to ask you how your family relates to it now and have they been able to really see this, um, this, sh this space that you've created for yourself and how original and unique that is? Yeah. I honestly it's it always I think will feel like a little bit of a battle to get them to fully understand my choice in terms of my career path um but as far as whether or not they like love me and support me they they do um they just probably show it a little bit differently you know my my parents have never been the type to be like oh no matter what we'll be really proud of you you can do anything you want type of thing they've always been a little bit more controlling than that um so it wasn't like i felt the complete freedom to just be exactly who i am or do exactly what i want but obviously i've pushed against that grain for so long that it's almost like i have beat my parents into submission a little bit in terms of them accepting it and and like of course they they love me right but it, it does make it a little harder that i have to be compared to my sister who kind of is a very traditionally successful person in a very traditional type of career path you know she has a phd um she's incredibly incredibly studied in the world of academia and so you know those things that i think are very commonplace for 
parents to be accepting of like, okay, yeah, my kid did that. Um, I definitely think that that just makes it harder because when you compare the two and juxtapose the two, it, it almost makes what I do worse. Um, but I, there's definitely a lot less explaining that I have to do. Right. Because at the end of the day, um, I don't rely on my parents for, for anything. So how can they really be upset when I've become an independent, um, self made successful woman? You know, I think that that's in and of itself, that that's a lot to be proud of as parents. And I think that they understand that. Um, but there's always going to be a little bit of a, a tiger mom, you know, there it's just, it's built into their DNA and there's like no changing that. Do they watch you on TV when you do, you know, on CBS or whether it's on ESPN or like, do they, do they no. watch? No, <laughs> no, I'll just stop you right there and say, that's like a hard no. I mean, no, they just don't, you know, to the point where I, I know like this is going to come across a little sad, but I promise you it's not. I don't even tell them like, I don't even tell them about the things that I do or if I'm going to be on TV. Um, I, I kind of just do my own thing. And again, like I know that they love me and that they would be proud of me, but it's not something that like at any time I even make a final table, you know, I'm not, I'm not really sharing that with them. You're like... <laughs> 80% of people's like absolute dream child, they would be like creaming over you all over town. But yeah, it's so interesting to see, uh, you know, to see you in this spot. I remember just hearing this from you a few years ago and thinking, wow, that, I mean, that just also those shows like your parents are clearly either just really great parents or also have just really great genetic stock because you and your sister are both incredible. And speaking of, you know, tiger parents and tiger people. Um, I did see one post that you made, which said that you, you know, are, have a lot of poker goals coming into 2022. And some people are really into goals. Some people are really against it. Uh, for those who are into this sort of, you know, manifest destiny, I think taking the time in the beginning of the year to look at what you're hoping to accomplish is probably a really good uh, idea. So let's, let's talk a little bit about that. What are your goals coming into 2022? Yeah, so I think that earlier on in my career, I think any of my poker goals would maybe have to do with like a financial monetary goal or, you know, winning X tournament or Y tournament. And I think now um, in the last couple of years, it's just shifted a lot to where I'm, you know, less interested in measuring my success by those parameters. I think the way that I really want to measure my success in poker is just what am I doing for the community on, on a regular basis to kind of build us up, to make us a little bit more accepted in the mainstream? I mean, whether we like it or not, there is still a little bit of stigma on poker. And of course, you know, coming from, from my family, um, I've experienced that firsthand. And I kind of want there to be a shift in that mindset for people so that maybe the next time there's a um, a little Taiwanese girl born into like a tiger family, maybe they don't feel like they have to explain their choices as much if it came to deciding to, to play poker for a living. Um, and so that's definitely one of those things. It's just like, I wanna make our community a positive place. I want people to view our community as something that can be very well respected. Um, and just to continue to be again, just one of those people that I think are very welcoming to especially recreational players. I feel like in the last couple of years, I, I definitely have noticed just some behavior at the poker table that I feel like is very unbecoming and unwelcoming. And I think that really hurts us as a community. And so that's really important. Obviously, in the last two years, we weren't really able to get out there and play a lot of live tournaments and whatnot. But the social experience and the social aspect of poker is still the most intriguing thing about the game and the, the reason why people love it so much in my opinion and because of that I just really want to protect that at all costs and especially when it comes to you know all of the things that people ask me as a woman in the game like how do we bring more women to the game and all of that stuff you know obviously those things are always at the forefront of my mind as well because unfortunately in my whole 15 years of being in poker I really haven't seen that drastic of a change in terms of numbers of of you know how many women are participating in these fields and you know even the stats reflect that as well and I think that that should be a problem um, that all of us should be thinking about and wondering how we can be a part of 
of the solution. You know, obviously I know right now, poker Twitter every day is embroiled in some hot take debate about some other stuff, you know, outside of outside of the game specifically. Um, and I really just hope that this year we can kind of like bring it back to what what we all love about the game and what's most important um, to keep our community thriving. Well, since you just happen to have a platform right now to talk about, what are some of the things that you see that you think are really disheartening for people who are new and fresh to the game? It's interesting because we shot the podcast itself before you and I sat down for this interview. And one of the things we talked about, for example, is Doug Polk just had Dan Bilzerian on his show. A little bit about, obviously, when Gigi signed Dan Bilzerian, there was a lot of drama and controversy. We call me unpopular opinion Sarah um, because... I tend to like just take unpopular stances and opinions, but I basically said, I think it was smart for them to, even though he's like, maybe not a person of great integrity or something, but he's a person who has a large audience and whatever we can do to get that audience is great. That being said, this always leads, you know, cascades its way into, okay, are we, in, who are we inviting into poker? Are these people that should be there? Um, but I'm always curious, like you're, you see way more poker than I do. Like, what are the things that you see that you think if we would stop doing these things, it would be more attractive to players? I mean, I think that there's just been a huge shift in terms of obviously nowadays the the best poker players, the most elite people in the field, there's a huge emphasis on on all the hard work that they did to get to that point, right? So they are studying constantly. They're they're putting so many hours, not just at the poker table, but behind the scenes in the lab, working on their game. And I understand that that is reflected obviously in their results. And I have a huge amount of respect for those players. And I've heard the arguments from these types of players that, you know, it's not their job to entertain people at the poker table, right? Like it's not their job to be social or, or whatever. But then I also think about what is kind of the lifeblood of this game. And that is a hundred percent recreational players, right? And recreational players show up to play poker kind of knowing that most likely they're not going to win. Um, but the reason why they're willing to pony up money and spend their time with, in the game is because they enjoy the social elements. They enjoy the social aspects. So it's not so much of like, how can we be like a monkey and dance for these people? But like, what are some things that we're doing that, that I think we don't need to be doing at the poker table to just make their experience a little bit better? Because at the end of the day, like, like I hate to say it but like those are the people that these elite players are making you know the money off of right so if that's the case then it, it there does have to kind of be a mutually beneficial um agreement between the two to kind of enhance each other's experiences right so um you know with these poker players there's a lot of like the stare downs there's a lot of the um kind of intimidating behavior because I understand that psychologically it's a part of the game and sure that might you know be a little plus EV in in the short term but I think it's kind of creating um, an, an environment that these players these recs don't want to necessarily come back to um, and just as a woman in general I think that you don't see it at the highest levels of the game necessarily, but you know, in these kind of huge fields, smaller buy-in events, um, there is still a little bit of this uh, misogyny at the poker table. You know, it's it's unfortunate, but um, you do feel like a fish out of water as a woman sitting down. You know, I don't get so much of that because now I think people know who I am, so they they probably have a different perspective on who like how I how I play or whatever it is, or maybe they want to be friendly to me. But um, I still see other women, you know, getting treated kind of as if they're, they're unwelcome, or it's a huge boys club, you know, and I think those are just things that um, just make it so that people might not want to come back. How, how has your experience been with women playing with other women? Do you get the sense that there's, um, especially at the lower stakes, okay, some misogyny, and then do you, but do you get the sense that at the lower stakes that women playing against each other are generally warm and receptive to each other? Or have you also had, I've had the experience sometimes of playing with like other women where I felt more mm -hmm. belittled by the other women than I have been by men. And it made me just feel like, okay, the problem is we need to stop belittling yeah. new players more so than like, 
I, I just haven't had a lot of experiences with like the sexual comments, which I don't know why, because I'm extremely sexy. <laughs> uh, no, you actually are. And I don't need you to be sarcastic or self-deprecating when you say that. Um, yeah, you know, it's interesting because I, when I play against women, I always have had a really positive experience, but I actually did hear from a few women about this particular um, ladies event at the World Series where women experience kind of a negative environment playing with other women. And so it is interesting, like I, I'm not really sure what's kind of causing that divide, whether it's, you know, is, is it like a pro versus a beginner type of vibe or is it just that poker naturally makes people feel super competitive against each other. And so there becomes this like adversarial relationship because you know that that's your opponent at the table um or is it that women feel more competitive with other women simply because it's it feels like there's only so few of you guys that it's just more noticeable like oh maybe naturally this person is more my my opponent or nemesis than this random guy at the table like i'm not i'm not really sure what fuels that mindset but I do think that the biggest problem probably just still remains with like people who are pros that kind of use some type of intimidation factor, whether it's, you know, criticizing people about the way they play or making them feel uncomfortable, like they don't belong so that maybe they'll make more mistakes against them. Like, I'm not, I'm, I'm not really sure what it is in the meta game that's kind of creating that, but I think it's just always a little bit more between somebody who is wanting to get any edge that they can, and then a newer novice recreational player. Well, you're so right. I mean, I am definitely a novice player. And I always say like, when I buy in, I look at it as like entertainment money. It's like what I would expect spending, you know, going to the movies. Like I just expect to lose the money and expect to hopefully get drunk and have fun with people. And if it's not fun, um, then yeah, like you're, you're losing that, that gift. And, and I couldn't agree with you more. And it's interesting, you know, Maria, to hear you say, okay, years ago, I might have been, you know, judging or looking at, at my accomplishments based on like, you know, financial, financial numbers or like financial aspects, but um, the older you grow that things, you know, you're looking a little bit more at the macro and a lot of poker players that I've talked to, uh, this is something we talk a lot about on the podcast, actually, that so many well-known and respected, accomplished professional poker players, um, A, that they care a lot about charity and um, about giving back. And that's something that's very clear with you. You're all over the place all the time at all the charity tournaments. You're always donating your money. In fact, you just um, did something, I think, for like women's Alzheimer's, which the world has hardly even gone again and you're already at at poker tournaments focusing on charity but something else I've seen a lot of the biggest pros um do and shift to in the last few years as we've moved into this more like middle age time in our life is looking into other businesses looking into you know ways to hedge their bets in terms of like retirement um you know different sort of financial you know looking into cryptocurrencies and and other ways to hedge say our bets against the dollar um and I'm curious because you did say that you were working another post you made, you said you were working on a lot of um, really cool projects, some of which you maybe can share, some of which maybe you can't, I don't know. But um, I'm curious to hear about what kind of projects you're thinking about at this point in your life and um, how much they all connect back to poker, if so at all. Yeah, I mean, I feel really lucky to be a part of the poker community because I feel like we always kind of have our ear to the ground of something new that's going on before the rest of the world hears about it. And that's probably because most of the people in poker um, are have a higher risk tolerance. And so they're kind of willing to maybe go into a direction that's not completely established or proven, but they're like, huh, I think there's something to this. You know, they they are really willing to kind of be open into welcoming, you know, certain new ideas. And obviously the biggest one being crypto. I think I heard about Bitcoin, you know, almost 10 years ago, just from another poker player. Um, and I feel so, so lucky to have known about cryptocurrency before it's become kind of as big as it has been. And so in this coming year, I definitely want to focus on, as you mentioned, a couple of my, my own businesses, but also I've been doing a lot of advising for other businesses. You know, I'm currently helping advise to develop a poker game, which I think can be pretty cool. Um, I can't really go into too much detail about that, 
But um, also I'm really interested in the NFT space as well, which has kind of lent itself from, you know, a natural progression from crypto and, and blockchain technology and all of that. Um, and I think there's definitely a lot of really cool uses for NFTs. I think there's a lot of real world implications that I think later on we're going to see with, you know, that kind of being your way to stamp your ownership on something, whether it's digital or physical, you know, a lot of people are talking about how to use NFTs in the real estate space. My parents come from a real estate background. Um, so I'm like, okay, that's super interesting. You know, instead of using a deed for ownership, you know, using an NFT to, to own your home and just I a feel lot of like these- you have to explain maybe now, maybe <laughs> most of our audience is already familiar because I think like you said, the poker space is whatever it is, but for anyone in our audience, who's just like a Maria Ho fan or whatever, who doesn't really know yet at this point, what an NFT is, or, um, it's kind of like, I remember like trying to explain cryptocurrencies to people. Could you explain, um, before we like delve too far into it for those who might be listening, like just a basic what's an NFT? Yeah. An NFT is a non, it stands for non-fungible token. And right now, I think the biggest application that maybe people can understand is art. So, you know, for example, if you had a ton of money and you're a baller and you own a Jackson Pollock or whatever, and it's in your home and you display it proudly, you paid so much money for it. um, People come into your home and obviously you're like, okay, like they see it on your wall. They know that you own it. That's great. But NFT now in the art space is being used as, okay, somebody creates a digital asset. And, you know, right now people are, you know, whether it's like a JPEG or, you know, people have a lot of jokes about, okay, but who really cares about somebody owning like a a photo that people can just right click and save? Well, I think what's interesting is, is that you can show your ownership of something and you can show its authenticity because everything is on the blockchain. Whereas, you know, if you just have some art piece hang on your wall, it's not like people will necessarily know if it's real. You can't really trace the lineage or, you know, the line of ownership. And so it kind of leads to maybe some some fraudulent exchanges. You know, if somebody were to buy that painting from somebody else, you know, they need to go get it authenticated through a third party. And so, you know, in these types of transactions, it's kind of hard to, you know, know who really has true ownership to something um, and to also be able to authenticate it. And so with something like NFTs, you're able to, as I said, you know, it's all on the blockchain who, you know, previously owned it, who originated this artwork um, and who now currently has ownership. Um, So I think obviously there's, there's just that element of if it's a collectible or if it's something that you think is going to appreciate and value, it's just really cool for that to be very transparent now and kind of out in the open and people don't really have to question what it is that they're buying into. So I I love this. And also, um, so you just like briefly skimmed over, but said that you're also um, advising on like a new game or some sort. So this is like secret for later. You're going to let us know when you're able to talk about this. Yeah, definitely. It's kind of a comp. I, I will say this. It's it's a compliment to poker. It's not like I'm, um, it's not like I'm coming up with a brand new game, like, you know, um, like Badoogie or, or short deck. Um, but it's a compliment to those who already know how to play. And it's, it's a vehicle to help people get better at the game, but it's not, specifically supposed to be a study or a training tool it's kind of supposed to enhance um the game of no limit hold'em as it's already being played well i'm always into like whatever you've got your hands on it seems like everything you touch turns to gold and i everything like when things are launching and things are happening you always need to let me know um so we can get you on the podcast so we can talk about it uh i already have have taken more time of yours than i originally set out to um so i do want to let you go and i know you need to set your dvr and everything for the amazing race um tonight <laughs> yes um we but, might need to start like a, a little thread just yes. about our reality shows so that yes. we can powwow after please um and yeah but is there anything else that you want to lay out there of course before I let you go you have to for those who don't know where to follow you where to find you all of that but um is there anything else that you want to share with us before I let you go 
No, I mean, honestly, I just, I have a lot of optimism about this year just for poker. You know, I really hope that we're able to kind of put the last couple of years behind us and, and go a little more full steam ahead. And I just, honestly, I just really miss it. I haven't traveled the tournament circuit for two years. I'm just kind of looking forward to things returning to some type of our new normal. And uh, I, I really just want all of us to do well and to thrive. And I want poker to continue to grow. Um, and yeah, and people can follow me at uh, Maria Ho on Twitter and Maria underscore Ho on Instagram. Are you going to the Global Poker Awards in February? You may be like hosting them. I don't even know, but. Um, I think that I will be attending. I'm not 100% sure, but yes, as of now, I'll be there. And I just have to say like the highlight of any Global Poker Awards ceremony I've ever been to was 100% your speech the year that you won. So no, I'm serious. I like think about that. Every time like the, the Global Poker Awards comes around, I'm always like, wow, that was like an amazing speech. And that was like so awesome and so well-deserved. And I was like, yeah, no, really. That's the thing that I think about. Gosh, we could just like suck up to each other. Cause I was going to say uh, you won the same year for like broadcast of the year. And I was like, oh, she's so classy. And like your speech was so nice to everyone. And I was just like, so spazzy. And like, I'm pretty sure I got blackout uh, drunk that night. So I'm sure I made a really good uh, impression on everyone, but I just adore you. I miss you also. I was kind of secretly asking personally, cause I think I'm going to go and I